So up next uh, is our flash mobs uh, segment. This is a series of short presentations by some of the people that are bringing us the next iterations of the internet. Um, first, we have Yancey Strickler. Um, so a floating swimming pool in the Hudson River, a series of interchangeable lenses that attach to your iPhone camera, a video camera built into a set of sunglasses that can record everything that you see in real time. These products don't exist yet, but they will soon, thanks to Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a website that allows artists and designers to fund projects by going directly to the public. Uh, so far, 700,000, let me make sure I have this right. Uh, more than 700,000 people have contributed more than $70 million to artist projects on Kickstarter, and 100 more are posted every day. Uh, Kickstarter has introduced a radical and radically successful new model for innovation, and here to talk about it is one of the co-founders, Yancey Strickler. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Yancey, and I'm one of the founders of Kickstarter. Um, as Jason was just explaining, Kickstarter is a funding platform for creative projects. So it's a way for musicians, filmmakers, artists, photographers, designers, technologists, to make the things that they want. And they do it by reaching out directly to their audience and to the internet uh, to raise the funds that they need. But both those words, creative and projects, are important to us. We don't allow fundraising for charities or causes. And everything must be a project, a, per a precisely defined thing with a beginning and an end. So we don't allow any sort of open-ended fundraising on the site. Um, this is a Kickstarter project page. And, and one of the tricks about Kickstarter is that all the funding is all or nothing. So when you start a project, you say how much money you need to do it, and you give yourself an amount of time to raise those funds, so typically about 30 days. If you raise, or if you raise your goal or exceed it by the time of your deadline, all the credit cards are charged, and you get your cash, and you do your thing. If you come short, then you don't get anything at all. So this project right here, which is to put on a 24-hour cycle of waiting for Godot, you can see it has 10 hours left to raise $575. So if no one else pledged to this project, it would not happen. In this case, it did, and projects always do when they get to this moment. So we've been around for about two years, and during that time, uh, the site has had some success. We've had over 9,000 projects successfully funded. Over 700,000 people have supported a project, and collectively, they've contributed. It's now over $70 million. And right now, it's over $2 million a week that's being pledged to projects on the site. And in terms of how we make our money, if a project is successfully funded, we take 5% of the total amount raised as our fee. One interesting thing about Kickstarter is that the moment at which your project is almost certain to succeed, the point at which you're going to make it, is actually when you raise just 30% of your funding goal. So projects that raise 30% of their goal eventually make it over 90% of the time. So it's really about getting that core audience. You have people who really buy into what you're doing. And if they do, they will buy into your story and they'll tell it. And they'll share it around the, west, the rest of the web. So that, that threshold to reach is pretty low. And you see that also in how the money is distributed. So even though 44% of projects succeed, over 85% of the funds go to projects that do make it. So it's really feast or famine. There's either support for your idea or there's not support for your idea. And we think that this statistic really shows uh, how effective the all or nothing idea is. Um, so why is it that Kickstarter works? What is it about these projects or, or this platform that's allowing people to have this kind of success? And there, there are a lot of reasons that you could cite, but the one that I like most of all is that every project is a story. Each project is a story of a real person doing something important to them, something of note, something that they really care about. And we get a chance to not only follow along and watch what happens, but to participate in all sorts of meaningful ways. And these stories are told through a couple of different ways. Uh, the biggest is video. We're primarily a video-driven site. 80% of products launch with a video, and videos are basically commercials made, made by normal people. It's a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes of someone saying, this is what I want to do. Here's how I'm going to do it. Here's why I should be a part of it. But people are uncomfortable pitching themselves. So they include all the false takes, the weird mistakes they made. They want to show that we're just like us. They want to show that they are the audience member, that there's not a line in between. Um, and to give you a sense of how these work, I'm going to show you a, a little montage that's sort of the typical Kickstarter video. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Hello, Kickstarters. Hey. Hello. Hello. I thought we were going to do hello. Hi. I love your new shoes. Are those new shoes? Hi, my name is Raquel. And I'm totally naked. Yay! And I could go on, but this is a Kickstarter campaign video, and I haven't even told you what my project is yet. 
would like to help my dad publish a children's story. We get together and we do a podcast. Ride House Musical. Stop motion animations. Let people actually be able to buy a couture dress that they themselves design. This time I decided to write things that were more lyrical. I made a film called Codependent Lesbian Space Alien Seek Same. Right now, I'm sitting on over 200 hours of incredible footage. I'd like your help to complete it. Kickstarter does not work without you. We need you to be a part of this. This is a collaborative experience. Your support, of course, will not go unrewarded. We've got CDs, posters, t-shirts. I think together, uh, we can literally be the next great frontier in space and Earth exploration. Let's go make a story. I'm really excited for this. I think that this is worth doing. We could make it together. Thanks for watching our Kickstarter video. video. This project is really important to me, and any support is greatly appreciated. And so you see a lot of faces. You see just people. That's what this is. It's, it's real people talking to you about what it is that they care most about. And the other way these stories get told are through rewards. Um, we're going to go back a slide, sorry. Our rewards. So it's, it's not a donation platform. I don't just give you $10 and get nothing. I give you $10, and I get $10 of something in exchange. And it's up to each project creator to sculpt what that is. The one thing that's not allowed is any sort of financial return or equity that's strictly forbidden. But most commonly, you see if I'm writing a book, you get a copy of the book. Maybe I name a character after you. Maybe you get invited to the set, or you get a walk-on role, or you get to do the hand claps on track three. Whatever people want to offer, it's, it's completely up to them. This picture here, this Polaroid that you see in the background, this is the best reward I've gotten from any Kickstarter project. There was very early on, we had an art project by a woman named Emily Richmond. Part of it was to sail around the world. And she said for $15, at some point on her trip, she would take a Polaroid picture and she would mail it to you from wherever she was next time she got into port. And about two months ago, I got a weird envelope in the mail that was beat to shit, had these weird stamps on it, and I open it up and I find that inside. And it's folded up inside of a map. And written on one side of the map is a letter describing exactly where she's sitting on this island in the Pacific. On the other side, she had circled the island on the map itself. And I got this for $15, and I'm a part of Emily's story, and this is something that has deep meaning to me. You know, it's, it's romantic, it's amazing. This will stay in my dresser mirror for the rest of my life, and I'm a stranger on the internet who gave her $15. And this is really what's happening on a large scale. So I want to walk you through the two biggest projects we've had so far, and they really give a good sense of sort of the yin and yang of, of how the site works. And, and the first is called Blue Like Jazz. And Blue Like Jazz is a New York Times best-selling book about five or six years ago. And the author of the book, Donald Miller, had been working for years to adapt it into a film. They had raised money, they had a cast, everything was set. And then September 16th of last year, they lost their funding. The traditional money came in and said, no, we don't like this. We don't think this is going to work. And the whole thing got canceled. So two fans of the book saw this blog post and thought, we want to change that. So they reached out to, the, they reached out to Donald Miller and, the, and the, the filmmaker, and they said, how much would it take to get the production restarted? And they said, $125,000. So the guy said, cool. They started a Kickstarter project to try to do it. And five weeks later, the project finished raising $350,000. Restarted production, the film will be in theaters this fall. And so why do people become a part of this? Well, A, there's a story that they're now a huge part of. This movie is their movie. Whenever this comes out in theaters, they get to claim some moral ownership over this. They get bragging rights. But also, they get things. Everyone who backed the project gets a personal phone call from the director saying thank you. That's 4,495 phone calls, which he is still making. Um, for $100, you got to be an associate producer on the film. 799 people did that. For $10,000, the, the author of the book would come to your house and do a screening personally with you. About 10 people did that. So people had this chance to really become a part of this, something that they really loved in a very meaningful way. But also, Kickstarter started to be used for pre-orders and product design and, and things that aren't quite as artistic or, or have a different kind of story behind them. And a great case is something called the TikTok. The TikTok was designed by a guy named Scott Wilson, and it's a, a wristband that turns an iPod Nano into a watch. And he's an established guy. He's made things in the past. And so he took this around to the iPod accessory companies, see if anyone wanted to put money into it. And, and no one liked it. They said, you know, there's not going to be an audience for this. It's too expensive. It's just not going to happen. So he put up a Kickstarter project to try to raise $15,000 to manufacture a few hundred, because that's when it became feasible to, to go through the process. Fast forward four weeks later and he had raised $950,000 and sold pre-orders for 14,000 of these, and it went on sale in the, in the Apple Store a few weeks ago. And so here what happened was he gave people a chance to have a greater ownership of the story and a greater connection to it. Those 13,512 people, you know, they're just waiting for someone to ask what that thing is when they're wearing, because they get to tell the story about how this happened. And for Scott, he gets to have this perfect product. He made it in a way that imbued a story directly into the thing itself, 
and allows it you know, to just exist in the world. I mean, this is, this is a piece of, of plastic and rubber that has an author in a way that we don't normally think of it and has that story just intrinsic to its very nature. But of course, not every project makes it. And the reason why projects fail are reasons that honestly we feel comfortable with. They're people who just haven't done a lot of work in the past. They're, this is like their first attempt to do something. Generally what happens to these projects, these are people who have done good work, who know how to tell a good story, and they're cashing in on that gravitas. They're saying to their audience, hey, we've done these things before, here's, here's my next thing. So the projects that fail kind of should fail. Not that they're bad ideas, but maybe they haven't done that legwork they need to get there. Um, so Kickstarter itself, we, we have an interesting story. Um, we're not a, a typical startup by any means. Um, my co-founder and our CEO, Perry Chen, first had the idea 10 years ago. He was living in New Orleans and he was trying to put on a concert and he didn't have the money to do it. And he thought, if only I knew beforehand how many people wanted to go to this thing, I could create a threshold. And if enough people wanted to go, it would happen. If it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Um, so he had that idea and about four or five years later uh, in Brooklyn, he and I met at a restaurant uh, called Diner, this restaurant here, where I was a regular and he was my waiter. And Perry was waiting tables. I was working as a music journalist at the time. Uh, one day over brunch, we were shooting the shit, and he, he just mentioned this idea. And so we started to work on it together. Uh, it took us a while. Neither of us are technical. You know, a, a waiter and a, a rock critic are not the ideal founding team. Um, but somehow we managed to make it work. And we thought a lot about the fact that most ideas are just ideas. You know, they're not trying to produce revenue. They're not trying to make people rich. You just want that thing in your head to exist in the real world, and you want to feel proud of that. And that those kinds of ideas had no home in the world, and that we wanted to create a place that was different, that supported that kind of thing. And that's kind of what we've done. Um, this is our office here in the Lower East Side. We're right, of, right above the bar there. Um, this is our front door, uh, which I kind of enjoy. Um, we get a lot of confused people coming to see us. Um, you could try to find our buzzer there. I'll give you a dollar if you can. But you know, this is just this is the world that we come from, and this, this is how we approach this. We just think about how can we help more art and culture exist in the world, and, and you know, how is it that we can help people do the things that they love? So at this point, um, packed into this small tenement building, we're, we're 25 people. Um, you could see the whole team here. This is uh, our team page. We have little animated GIFs of everyone just laughing. Um, but this kind of describes who we are. We're, we're half and half people who work on the technology and who work directly with artists to help them make their dreams come true. Um, so thank you so much for your time and for listening. And uh, it's great to be here. I, I love that story. Um, that was amazing. Uh, so here's a scenario. You've moved. You've just moved into a new house or apartment. And uh, you've been unpacking boxes all day, and you're sweaty and exhausted. And it's 3 in the morning, and you realize you just want to take a shower and go to bed, and you realize that you don't have any shower rings. So what do you do? You've got a few options. Um, this is New York, so you could probably find a 24-hour hardware store. Um, you could take a bath, which sounds terrible. Um, or you could fire up your MakerBot and print some shower rings immediately. Uh, MakerBot is the world's first affordable 3D printer. Um, it has been used to make everything from puzzles to gears to a bust of Stephen Colbert's head. Uh, and our next speaker, Bree Pettis, is the founder of MakerBot. He's going to talk about how it's revolutionizing design and manufacturing. So Bree, come on out. Cool, good to be here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about social networks. I'm going to talk about things. And I'm pretty excited about this because things are something we don't really think about in technology anymore. We think about, like, you know, a lot of we've talked about the cloud. We've been talking about, you know, social networks. Not community, mind you, but social networks. And um, let's so I'm going to talk to you about robots and that makes things, gears, gangsters, drabbits, and clocks. And just a quick question. How many of you in your business have, have a portion of it where you share something, an open source part of it? OK, those without your hands up, consider your business over in five years. So this is the MakerBot. It's open source. You can download all, every design file. If you're a user, you know exactly how it works. You can improve it. You can modify it and release the, your improvements, and everybody benefits. And I've got a little video here where basically, yeah, I'm going to skip that, because you can go ahead and see it right over here, because we're printing out stuff all day. 
And uh, basically, the way we work is we want to give everything away in terms of uh, the way that it works and how it works, the design files, schematic files, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of people freak out when they hear this. And they're like, you don't have anything that you keep and hide secret and all this kind of stuff? And we're like, no, and we like it that way. It's better. And it's, I could go on and on about open source. And uh, instead, I'm going to talk about um, what do you do when you have a machine that can make you anything? What, when you have the potential to like, just manufacture things on your desktop? And usually, because we're so used to buying things, we, when, you, when we find out we can make anything right now, we think, wait, what? And so. You can make some really crazy and wonderful things. Here's a snake. Here's a little heart box that you could put a present in for your sweetie. Here's a whistle. Maybe you need to go referee a game. It prints out the little ball inside as well. An octopus. It's like a barrel of monkeys, but with more legs. Um, and you can push the envelope of what's possible. We've got users who are making. Uh, cathedral play sets where there's a, you can put it all together and have a cathedral in any way you want. And here's a, uh, this is designed uh, to be like this big, so like too big to turn around in your bathtub. And it's made in components. So even though the machine can only make things about five by five by five inches, you can do whole sections and then smush them all together to do, all, to do bigger things. So OK, so you can make anything. But what if you can take anything and then mush it together with anything else? You get digital mashups, which I mean, it goes from the interesting and the weird and the wacky to the downright bizarre. So you've got a dragon head, and then you've got a bunny, and you put them together, and you get a drabbit, which those of you know, especially the British in the audience, is deadly. Don't throw hand grenades at them. So this just works. You take something, you take something else, you smush it together, you upload it to our site, Thingiverse, which is our place where people share digital designs. And then other people can download them and improve them and do wonderful things with them, publish them under an open license, like a Creative Commons or a GPL license, and then you win. And then, you know, as with anything that you put on the internet, the unexpected things happen. So, our whole mission is to create infrastructure for creative people to do wonderful things. And part of that is this culture of sharing. And as we're not used to a culture of sharing. I mean, we grow up and in kindergarten, we're like, OK, uh, we learn to share toys. But then we go to school and get a job, and we're like, no, this is mine. There's a line, there's a fence, you can't go over it. But it turns out when you share things, just like you learned when you were a kid, you really often get more back when you share things. And one of the wonderful things about the internet is it lets you do attribution really well. So when we set up Thingiverse, we made it so that when Wiseorg uh, uploaded a gangsta, um, you can go and if somebody thinks this is cool, uh, they can, well, first of all, he's published it under the CC by share alike license, which means you can absolutely copy this as much as you want, and you can actually modify it as long as you release it under the same license. So you go ahead and you press, I made one, which is something you can press on there. And it says, did you make just a copy? If so, just upload a picture. And that'll show the original designer like how cool it is that you made your own copy of it. Did you modify the design and improve it or change it or make it worse? Go ahead and upload the actual file, and it'll automatically give attribution to Wiseorg so that he knows that you modified his thing and he gets credit for kind of like having the first gangsta. And in fact, that becomes important when this first went up, we were like, OK, that's cool. He printed it out. It's a little like kind of gangsta figure. It's kind of got, he's got bad posture and a hoodie. And then you take the snake that we saw earlier, and you put them together. And instead of having a gangsta, you've got a snakesta. And then you can take that gangsta and de-res it. So it's like it's just going through a bad version of Tron or something like that. And I'm clicking fast here. Devilsta, put the devil on his head, and you've got a devil gangster. Uh, you've got a talisman, which hangs around your neck, stalista, Bud budsta. You've got budsta, the legend continues, which is the stalista and the budsta, which is a mashup on top of a mashup. Take the rabbit. You've got rabbitsta. 
take the rabbit's, take the gangsta and put it on top of the rabbit, and you've got the bunny star, the ga gangstank. Yes. Uh, then you've got more decimated bunnies. People love this bunny. It's a very classic model. You can put Optimus Prime's head on it. It's party. Put his head on the gangsta, and you've got Prime stuff. It it really is not stopping. Like I've had to keep like in making this project in this presentation, I had to keep updating it. This is one of those things that you push down and it folds over, but it's a gangsta instead of like a pony. We all know Han Solo's in, in, in carbonite, but now you can get a Lego man in carbonite, and of course the carbonite stuff. And then if you take this, the, the gangsta and you cut him in half and you put the bottom half on top of the bottom half, you get the sta sta. Take Walt Disney's head, which somebody made a, a model of and published under a Creative Commons license, and add an actual brain, which is from a medical model, and put it in Walt Disney's head, and you have, well, something that shouldn't exist in real life. And then you can put it on a gangsta. <laughs> and then you can make a gangsta pee, and then of course it just keeps going to the next level. Somebody uploads a urinal, and then People, well, yeah, this is, you know, when it gets to the point where people are peeing, you know it's a meme, right? So uh, two designers had a, a battle. One, wanted, one had something that the other wanted, and the one wanted to pay for it, and the other one wanted, wanted to give it to him. And so they made a deal. Okay, we have one hour, and you have to do a derivative of the gangsta, and whichever one gets more likes at the end of the day wins. And so the first one uploaded a pesta, which is a pez topper, like it actually, like you print it out on a MakerBot and you stick it on a Pez top and you dispense candy with a Stetson and a bow tie. Cool. And um, the other one made Chesta and he totally won. <laughs> so he got to, his, his winning what meant he got to send the thing for free without having the other guy pay for it. Which, so it's gentleman's argument. Uh, 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 Scan Colbert, of course, there was Colbert stuff. And it just went on and on. This is, a, this is a few days ago, and there's already been like another 10 derivatives of Colbert's head, including the statue of Colberti, and just horrible ideas that when you have them, you realize that you have to make them real. And then you print them out. So right now, we're, we've got this community of people that are doing wonderful things. And, um, oh, and it's going to be easier. When you have a community of people who are doing things, it's important to give them ways to connect, ways to work together, ways to actually like have infrastructure for creativity. If, you, if your users aren't talking to each other, uh, try and make that happen. It's one of the most wonderful things that you can do. And there will be more things to mash up. Um, I'm just going to move right through this. So there's Mesh Mixer to do this. This is actually just came out for the Mac as well. So you just, it makes it really easy to take two models and just smush them together. It's like, uh, it's easy. It's like kind of iPhoto easy. And it's weird. Uh, OpenSCAD is for programmers in the audience. If you're a programmer, uh, this is a program that makes it really easy for you to mash up things and actually do amazing parametric designs. And uh, part of this, again, is about a culture of sharing. All these uh, OpenSCAD and Pavre and these kind of things are open source projects where people have said, oh, I wanted to do this. And so they take the code base. They add to it, they improve it, and then they re-release it, and it's better. Uh, all these kind of, this kind of openness gives people permission to play. If people aren't taking apart the products that you're making in some way and making them better, they're not improving your product, and they could be. Um, just going to skip right through these. I've got these gears over here. This guy, made, this guy made that last gear, which is like a heart that's all a gear. And, um, he, was, he did clearly like says, like, I took this guy's gear script. I, took, I, took this, I had seen this guy's broken heart, but I wanted it to be different so you could twist it differently. And he's giving attribution. It's something that people do in this culture of sharing where they say, if there's something cool, let's, let's really give people attribution so that they know that since we're building on top of them, they get the credit for it. And then it's kind of like you stand on the shoulder of giants. So if you stand on my shoulders and somebody else stands on your shoulders, eventually I can stand back on somebody's shoulders who's stopping on my shoulders. And it's like a standing on shoulders Mobius strip. 
So there's the original one. And then it just goes on as you know, like when these things, the derivatives happen, we've got a sphere, we've got a cube that twists and gets all deformed. Of course, the weighted storage cube, these things have to happen. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about just the clocks for a, a minute. And this is an amazing story. And basically this guy wanted to make a clock that he could make or bot. And he just decided, okay, I'm just gonna try this out. I'm gonna make a little simple model and it won't work, I know it. But he uploaded it anyway as a, bro, as, a as a model that didn't work. And people printed it out and tried it out and gave him feedback. And this happened a lot. He did a lot of different iterations on this. And a whole community came together. They ended up getting their own Google group and stuff like this to basically work on making a printable clock. And it's to the point now where all the different parts work separately, the escapement which goes back and forth and then all the gears which now do minute, hour and second hands, which is cool, and they all look really cool. And it also helps when people get together. Getting your users together, again, I mentioned that. It's just cool. They, they're happy when they're, they're working on things and they actually get to be together. Oh. So this is the end. I'm going to go back a step here. Um, so the big ideas here are like your basically share just share. Not, many, not enough of you had your hands up with your business as a sharing entity. If you're not doing it, the, the internet will kill you. Uh, encourage the ed, edge cases. And encourage people to do off, what's called like off-brand uses of your, your technology. And when they do, find ways of incorporating that in and adding it to what you do. Embrace that rather than than do that. Microsoft learned that with a Connect recently. That's been a very powerful lesson for them. Uh, let them connect. I keep saying that over and again, uh, over and over again, and, and make things happen. And we're just at the beginning of this time of sharing. And so, you know, even though I'm saying if you're not doing this, you're going to die, it's the perfect time to start exploring these kind of options. And I hope you do, and wonderful things will happen. So, thank you. So uh, when you work at Wired Magazine, you come across people like Steve Perlman every once in a while. Um, there aren't that many of them out there, but we tend to write about them. And they're people that, frankly, kind of piss me off a little bit. Because you know, Steve Perlman didn't have to invent OnLive. He had already created Web TV. He was one of the founders, one of the guys who worked at Apple on QuickTime. He'd already revolutionized several industries and destroyed several more. Um, but you know, what the hell? Why not create a cloud-based streaming video game service? Why not? Um, now he's apparently uh, going to announce some new uh, development that's going to destroy several more industries. So uh, he's done it before. I'm sure he'll do it again. Let's bring him out. Steve Perlman. All right. Thanks, all Thanks very much. All right. So I get the privilege of doing a live demo with lots of tricky technology, much of which which is brand new. So while they're setting up there, um, First of all, uh, I don't know if uh, any of you have already heard of OnLive. Has anyone heard of that service? All right, a few hands. I like that. So it's a uh, video game service that we've developed that uh, allows us to run video games from the cloud. Rather than having any computational power locally, and of course games are very performance demanding, we have all of them running in data centers. And the data centers can be about 1,000 miles away. So, Certainly for gamers, there's lots of reasons why that's great. And I've got the first couple of slides, once they get the uh, slide deck going, talk about that. Um, but the, the thing about video games is they're so performance demanding with instantaneous response, with high performance graphics, with you know, suddenly changing scenes, that in order to make that work with a video going through the internet over any kind of connection, even a wireless connection <clears throat> at a network show like this, where you know, there's obviously a lot of people going sharing the connection when you're tweeting or whatever you're doing. And so to make that work, so we're there? Yep. All right, good. So I think we can go move this onto the other screen, right? All right, good. So we got the other screen up. Oh, uh, I see you're duplicating the screen. Let me go and just do a real quick screen resolution thing here. Uh, OK. All right. Um, Second here. There we go. Hooray. 
Good. Okay. There we are. I'm live. Okay. It's a company that we um, took about nine years to develop. We have some big investors, lots of people, lots of IP. Okay. We talked about this uh, instant play video games. You don't have to have <clears throat> a particular console, Xbox or PlayStation 3 or high end PC. With OnLive, all you need to do is go to OnLive.com. You got a PC, Mac, could be a netbook. Uh, or a, any uh, TV set. We have TVs going to have online built in, or we have a little thing called a micro console, hooks up to a TV. And then any mobile device. It can be a, 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 you know, an iPad or Android, or, or set, et cetera. The way it works is we have video games hosted in a data center on the right there. And then on the left side, you have your little device. If you hit a button on that device, the action goes up through the internet, through whatever connection you got. It figures out the next frame of the uh, video game and then streams it down so fast that that round trip seems instantaneous. Perceptually, it seems like the game is running locally. It's pretty cool, and it's really worth giving it a try if you haven't tried it before. So what we're announcing today, we just did this big announcement with Juniper, and it's one of those big announcements that only, I think, some people understand just how big the implications are. Uh, and what we've done is we've created a no-compromise virtual desktop. Now, has anyone here ever used something like Citrix? Any hands? Oh my god, almost all the hands. OK, is anyone here like Citrix? Citrix? OK, you're going to love this demo. Does anyone have any stock in Citrix? All right, you're not going to like this demo. All right, so we've created a virtual desktop. It's kind of like what Citrix is talking about for doing for cloud thing. It's, it's nice if I can point to something that, that exists, except the remote desktop feels local. In fact, a lot of ways, it's better than local. Even everything in media, video and flash, it works instantaneously. It's compatible with all devices, PCs, Macs, tablets, phones, monitors, even TV sets, if you're doing a presentation in a boardroom or something. And the cloud-based apps can have unprecedented performance. Sure, we could do office apps like Outlook or, or um, you know, PowerPoint, et cetera, but we could do really high-end apps. It's scalable, maintainable, and particularly because of this relationship that we have with Juniper, it's secure. And you see the diagram looks just like the video game diagram. We could run something like Office. We could run Autodesk apps in the data center. And then when you hit a button on your keyboard, mouse, or whatever, it goes up through the internet and then comes back down, but using video game class, low, latent, low, low latency video. So the screen updates so fast, the desktop on any of these devices feels like it's running locally. Sounds unlikely? Well, here you could see a uh, video window that I'm playing. And the thing I'm going to show you now is that, in fact, what we've been doing all this time is actually running through the cloud. I'm running a, a PowerPoint here. And uh, PowerPoint is, in fact, running in our data center 3,000 miles away. Oops. And I actually went on to the next slide. But PowerPoint is running in our data center 3,000 miles away. And I'm controlling it from here. So I have the full capability of PowerPoint. And if you don't believe that, then let me go and show you that I have a Windows desktop running here on this iPad separately entirely. And I can go and transfer PowerPoint over it. Then over on this Samsung Galaxy Tab Android tablet, I'll do even better than that. This is the OnLive service. And if you go into what we call the arena, normally what you do is watch people playing. Well, actually, I can go and watch this session of PowerPoint, no problem. And if you see there, I'll start playing. And there it is. So pretty cool, all right? And in fact, if I go and step out for a moment from PowerPoint, if I just minimize the window, you see I am on a Windows desktop. And if I go in here to um, this uh, Internet Explorer, uh, here's our OnLive website. Let me go to speedtest.net just to give you context of where we are. All right, so speedtest.net is loading. And again, where does it think we are? Take a look at this. OK, it thinks that we are here. Oops, it thinks that we are here uh, way over in California, because that's where our data center is. Let's see what our speed is. This laptop's running on Wi-Fi. 10 millisecond ping to California, over 250 megabits a second. Actually, we're not 250 megabits a second. What we've done is we've pinned speedtext.next. It's running off of a video game data center with 10 gigabits links going through our Juniper switches. Okay? So you've got 10 gigabit per second browsing running in this. All right? And so it's kind of cool. And uh, 
So let me go and go back to OnLive again to prove once again that that whole Outlook thing I was showing you is really virtually running very far away. And here I am in the OnLive service running. Um, and now what I can go do is go in the arena here, and now I can go watch stuff here. So I've got a couple of things here. And in fact, I'm going to go and watch this, which is this uh, iPad desktop. And I'm going to run PowerPoint here. There it comes up. In fact, what I'm going to do is load that very same presentation. I'm going to open PowerPoint presentations, and there it is. All right, so I can go there, and I can go and uh, find the slide that uh, I was just on, Media Rich. And uh, then I'll go and click there. And again, for those of you who've used Citrix, you've never seen anything like this before. I can go jump ahead, anything. Full flexibility with any level of video. I'm running it on an iPad over Wi-Fi with all of you folks going and perhaps jamming up the video channel here. OK, so. <laughs> <laughs> It's being hosted 3,000 miles away. All right, so the other thing I want to show you, which is kind of fun, is like if you're, so first of all, you have all the, you know, pinch and zoom stuff, okay? So if I wanted to go here and, uh, you know, edit something here, I can go bring up this thing here, and I can, instead of saying media rich, I can say, you know, media, you know, awesome, rich, okay? And, uh, you know, edit back there. So again, you have, the capability now, once again, of having everything you'd normally do in PowerPoint, but you're running on an iPad or whatever device. Then I could do even something cooler, like, you know, hello. I figured it out. All right. So we have, we have completely embraced the iPad, but we've carried over with a Windows desktop. And I'm running this whole damn thing 3,000 miles away. It's just awesome. Anyways, and you get all these games too, which is really cool. Of course, you would never do that while you're at the office, I'm quite sure. But anyways, so the other thing we bring to the iPad is, that, wait a minute, we've got a browser here, and we can go do that really cool thing with uh, speedtest.net, and I'm going to do that again, speedtest.net now, running on an iPad. But wait a minute, speedtest.net doesn't run on an iPad, it's a Flash app. But I'm going to run on an iPad now, and now I'm going to go pin speedtest.net with a 10 millisecond pin, a 10 millisecond ping, okay, so that's cool. And then I'm going to take you to this Mercedes-Benz site, which is this ridiculously complex uh, site uh, for Flash. And look how fast it's loading in. I mean, if you try this at home on a 6 megabit connection, this will take a minute or two. And I've got Flash running. No worries. The whole thing runs perfectly smoothly on an iPad. OK? So and here I am. Remember, I am spectating this amongst many other things. So let me show you one other thing I'm spectating. If you could bring up the, um, oh, this, this other Galaxy tab here. In the interest of time, I preloaded this. And uh, here I'm running something called uh, Autodesk Maya, which is one of the most advanced applications in the world. To show what Automax Maya can do, I'm going to quickly go and show in our showcase here, this demo here. And this shows the kind of 3D graphics, 3D characters that we create when you have unlimited computing performance. And I guess you can't hear the audio there. She's saying, Hi, I'm Jennifer. Welcome to OnLive. OK, so let's go back now to spectating. This shows what what the quality is. And then I'm going to go here. And then this is the tool that created it. Now, this is not a tool that can run on, on, a, on an Android tablet or an iPad. It's not a tool that can run on a laptop. But it runs just fine here. And in fact, of course, I get the full flexibility that you would normally have. Just about done here. And the full flexibility, I can zoom right into the pores in her skin. And I can go and rotate her, et cetera. So you're looking at the highest of high performance apps. This is it. This is as high as it gets, running on any device wherever you are in the world. So to wrap up, what we've done is we've completely virtualized computing. This is cloud in the most general sense of the world. Okay, And you can see we, the discipline of getting video games to run at super high performance made it absolutely uh, easy to knock out uh, you know, application level performance that's needed and make it run so beautifully on all these different devices. Very excited to be working with Citrix and have the announcement today with them. And it's the Citrix switches. Oh, man, did I say that? Oh, man. OK. Sorry. Very sorry. Very happy. Sorry about that. Very happy working with, uh, um, um, with Juniper. We have all of our data, our data centers, all Juniper switches. And that's why we're able to do such low latency stuff. 
Thanks very much. Thank you.